and welcome to kind of another video to uh, kind of a follow-up video on the video I did that the inverse square law uh, proves local sun reaction made by Dream Calibre. Now he has responded to me in my comments actually already a while ago um, but since the, the comment was automatically marked as spam by YouTube which is a, a bit funny but was very wrong it was absolutely not spam. Um, where where he said that uh, that he is I, I I assume that that's him or or even a fan of him because after I, I replied to this comment he replied with his Dream Caliber account right so this might be him I don't know um, where he said that when you look at a what's called a pyrheliometer and a pyr pyranometer I'm sorry I don't know if that's actually how you pronounce those in English um, you can on both of them see a pretty steep drop off of here he says drops approximately 200 watts per square meter. Um, we've had a very brief discussion, uh, well brief, <laughs> in the in the comment section below and I would like to go through what we talked about and I would like to go through the, the measurements behind it and what the conclusion of that is that you can draw, right? Um, so first things first. If you remember this video I modeled the, uh, I, I, in the video after this one, I modeled the, the, the thing and I talked about this kind of, I called it stretching of light, right? That the light is stretched out uh, more on the surface. I found out that that actually has a name. Um, it's called the, the zenith angle effect and it's explained very nicely on this website here. It's called the zenith angle effect. This is what I was talking about when I was talking about the stretching of light. Uh, you can see here that, that through this, this, this stretching you get a larger area. Of course the, the distance through the atmosphere also changes, but this effect is small compared to the, the change in area, right? This is the zenith angle effect that I was talking about. Then in the comment section Dream Calibre uh, told me that there are two kind of measurement devices. On the one hand we have a pyranometer, which is essentially this somewhat UFO looking device here. Um, it is pretty simple. You put it on the ground or wherever you want uh, and it rotates with the ground of course and you get uh, it, it, it measures the amount of solar radiation. So the pyranometer is very very much prone to detecting the uh, the change of, of the, the this zenith angle effect right. This, this very much applies to the to the pyranometer and so okay so we, we, we know that. That's one, that's the first measurement device, right? The second measurement device is what's called a pyrheliometer, which is kind of like a small, almost telescope, even though it doesn't amplify. Uh, it looks like that and it follows the sun around, right? So for that one, since it follows the sun around and the, the angle between the sun and this detector here is always going to be, or at least close to 90 degrees, this the, the, the zenith angle effect does not apply to the pyrheliometer, so it should, like except for the very early morning and the very late evening, always measure roughly the same, um, the same solar irradiance for both, uh, like for for uh, for the globe Earth. It shouldn't do so, so, however, on the flat Earth. So on a globe, what would you expect? Well, with the pyrheliometer. The only thing that really changes is the thickness of the atmosphere that you observe it through. At solar noon you look exactly up so you have the, the least amount of distance through the atmosphere and on, on in, the, in the evening or in the early morning you look through quite, quite a bit of atmosphere, right? I have sketched this out here, of course this is not a two-scale drawing, this is just to, to, make it, to make it understandable, right? So what you would expect is something like this. It reaches a maximum at solar noon and it, 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 it has almost kind of a plateau until the very early morning and the very late evening. I, I, I drew it here with irradiance and time and roughly the hours of the day in summer. It's, it's, it's of course not going to be absolutely correct. I just want to get the idea across, right? While a pyran pyranometer would measure something like this because it the, the, the this zenith angle effect applies, right? So, so you have a solar noon and it falls off pretty steeply until the from, from the morning it rises, reaches solar noon and then it falls pretty steeply again. The, that's what you would expect on a globe. On a flat earth, however, those two would look pretty similar since 
the main effect for both, the main change for both would be the changing distance to the sun. So these two would look very, very similar. For a pyrheliometer, you would expect a pretty steep fall off uh, after solar noon and, and right before, uh, like, and, and, and a pretty steep rise before solar noon. They would look very, very, very similar. Since the sun would be, it's supposed to be, to say close and local here. I, I wrote it down. Sometimes OneNote has problems synchronizing its notes. I, I'm very sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, so let's actually look at the data. So when you look at the data from multiple sources, I have, first of all, here this uh, Intejo Pen thing, which they, they apparently they produce solar panels and stuff like that. And they have a, actually a great uh, lecture, on, on, or it, it looks to me kind of like a lecture um, about, about solar radiation, measuring solar irradiance for photovoltaics. A very, very nice uh, thing to look at. I, had a, I, I learned something while reading it. I would encourage all of you to, to, to actually read it. They talk about spectra and things like that. I love it. Um, so what they, what they say here, and you, I hope you can see that very clearly. This black curve is direct. This is from a, a pyroheliometer. This, this is the one that we are looking for. We are not interested in global interviews. We're just interested in the direct things. So really what the pyroheliometer picked up directly. And you can see it rises pretty steeply. It reaches almost kind of a plateau. And at solar noon, which seems to be roughly somewhere between 11 and 12 here, um, it stays pretty much constant. You can go couple of hours uh, before that like we can we can go to 1500 hours and it's still it hasn't even changed by 100 watts per uh, square meter yet so that's precisely what we would expect on a globe but don't just believe my word for it you can also have different sources for that for example here this is uh, from australia this is, was from 2013 even though, as Dream Caliber pointed out in the comments, which we will look at in a bit, um, this was uh, recorded during a wildfire, so th these results may may, may vary. Um, you, you you can see that that again, this it, the it's, it's actually the right axis we need to look at here. It's this uh, DNI. You, we are not interested in the temperature. We are interested in the solar radiance, and you can see here. For a stretch of four to five hours, it remains pretty constant. It doesn't. E changes by, I'd say, roughly 50 watts per square meter, right? And the same thing is from, from a day from 2011, right? This is the, one of the best pictures of this sort I have seen. So you can see that you can go a couple of hours and then it doesn't change by more than 50 watts per square meter, right? Exactly what we would expect on a globe and, as a matter of fact, impossible on a flat Earth. So... What I find interesting about this is that uh, Dream Calibur, for, first of all, you asked me if there is an experiment that I can verify the stretching. And so we talked about it. Yeah, you can do it with a, with a, with a lamp or with a, a flashlight, which I actually mentioned in my video, which makes me think that he m might not have a look at it or had a look at it. To be fair, this conversation uh, happened about one and a half months after my video release, so absolutely fair play there. Um, he looks forward to the video. Well, I mean, you know, that's nice. Um, so he says that uh, I haven't used a pyroheliometer. That is pretty correct. I have never used one of those, although we have something at the at my university, something like it. It's not exactly a pyroheliometer, but it also me can measure the solar irradiance and it follows the sun around. So it's somewhat close to that. And he says that he has both a pyroheliometer and a pyranometer. And here at 35 uh, degrees north, there's a difference of, of approximately 180 watts per square meter between solar azimuth and two hours after that. So, so if we look at this graph here, yeah, right here, and two hours after that, here there's about 50 watts per square meters. And he says that there are, at, at his place with his particular equipment, there are 180 watts per square meter between solar azimuth and, 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 and uh, two hours after, right? Now, I sent him sources. The, this one from from the CSIO, CSIRO, and and from this um, um, photovoltaic manufacturer. He, the on the one thing he has pointed out very correctly that uh, this was recorded during a storm, but I was more or less referring to the one below that because you know, but still you can also take that one. So. Um, 
uh, and, and I mentioned that to him. I said, "Well, there's only about 50 watts of square meter, 50 watts per square meter difference. Two hours be behind that." And he says, um, "You know <laughs> that that uh, that there is way more than that, like 200 or something like that." And when I asked him asked him for the data or them for the data, they said that, "Well, he doesn't have the data on the web yet." Okay, fair enough. I I understand that. However, the current situation is the following. I've laid out how it's supposed to work on the globe. The data that we have available from these sources, I'm absolutely open to a whole bunch of other sources, absolutely agrees with the prediction the globe makes and disagrees with the prediction of a flat earth. Now, if Dream Calibre or anyone else for that matter has data that contradicts these measurements and is of course rep reproducible. I don't have a pyreheliometer, so I probably won't be able to reproduce it. Um, please share this data with me. I would be absolutely interested. Mind you, it has to come from a pyreheliometer, not a pyranometer. Two different things, as I explained in the beginning. If you have access to data that contradicts this very clear trend and, and doesn't have anything to do with clouds, but you can see clouds clearly on these things. So I, I assume that that's not going to be a big problem. Please share with me. But other than that, ah, you know, it's, uh, uh, the situation is that I have delivered data and a prediction and you have made a claim and not produced any data to back it up, except for you saying that well, you have this data, but it's not on the web yet. Which again, it, it, it is fair. But li link me to other pieces of data. Why not uh, have it around, right? So the, the last thing that I want to mention is it's pretty funny. I, I actually, I apparently I haven't read this comment in full yet, even though I, 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 I thought I had. Maybe he edited it or I didn't read it carefully enough. Um, so so he, he says that this drop thing is a mood talking point for whatever reason. Um, if the incident angle is always made to be 90 degrees, well, yes, of course. But you see, as it stretches, I, 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 I showed it in the, in the beginning in my, my sketch here. As the Earth rotates, the, the amount of atmosphere that the pyroheliometer has to look through increases. He, he says that most people, or they say that, uh, most people argue that uh, atmospheric pollution and water particulate is causing this drop. No, 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 absolutely not. I'm saying that this drop at the pirate heliometer is primarily caused by the changing thickness of the atmosphere that you have to look through. He says that uh, uh, the atmosphere is only about 60 miles thick when looking 90 degrees up. Well, that is pr pretty correct, depending on how you define thickness of the atmosphere, right? But but um, that that is in, in principle that is correct. But the pirate heliometer doesn't look 90 degrees straight up all the time, now does it? When the as the as the Earth rotates, the, the angle to the sun changes. So when, when the sun is low in the sky, you have to look through a whole bunch of more atmosphere. And then he goes on and and and, <laughs> and I find this pretty funny. This point has been explained to, to flat earthers a whole bunch of times. So on, on a side note, after reading the link you posted, I want to point out that this perihelion apelion mm, defies observable physics. Well, does it? <laughs> the closer an object is, uh, the more heat it radiates and, 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 and the hotter uh, other objects will become if the source of heat is closer. Absolutely, it does. Um, but somehow, during perihelion, the Earth is closest to the Sun, it's winter. Well, because of the aforementioned zenith angle effect, which you can read up actually on that link. Um, but it's first of all, it's only winter in the northern hemisphere. There is such a thing as the southern hemisphere, where it's summer there, actually. Um, first of all, second of all, the sun's distance to Earth changes by, I think it's like 4%, 5% or something like that. And so if, if you have a temperature variance of a small number as 4 or 5%, other factors just overwhelm, like the zenith angle effect, even currents like, like the, the, the Gulf Stream and things like that have a bigger effect on temperatures than the aphelion and perihelion of Earth around the Sun. So it absolutely doesn't defy it. I would encourage you, before you make claims like that, Dream Calibre, to maybe go through the calculations to see how much it would change, since you are such a big fan of the inverse square law, why don't you use it sometimes, maybe, right? 
<laughs> and summer when the Earth is farthest away from the sun. That is correct. Summer in the northern hemisphere, that is. Northern hemisphere, right? If the heliocentric model were true, then during perihelion, perihelion the whole Earth should warm up during aphelion. Well, I mean, it does by, again, the, the irradiance increases by about 5%. So it's, it's, ah, oh God, okay. Let's let's actually look at it that be, 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 because I don't know. So we look at Earth uh, Earth orbit around Sun, right? It's it it, it literally I'm it, it takes minutes to look this up. What, why don't you do that, right? Um, see, I mean, I, I know that you probably disagree with Wikipedia because you know, but but for for looking up numbers from our model, I I, I hope it is fine. And you can see here that it changes by about, as you say, 5 million kilometers. Look at the tiny difference between it. That's the, the solar irradiance due to the inverse square law. And I haven't calculated it. I'm just going out of it from the top of my head. Going to change by about 5%, if at all. The, the, the change in actual distance is less than 5%. It's about 3%, right? So when you say 5 million kilometers difference, that technically is correct. But when you meant, notice that we are actually about 150 kilometers away, 150 <laughs> kilometers, 150 million kilometers away, five million kilometers difference doesn't seem like that much of a change now, does it, Dream Calibur? So um, the conclusion here is uh, Dream Calibur has made a claim, has not provided the data. I have provided multiple links that from actually measured data that agree with me. I have laid out the prediction of the globe, the prediction of the flat Earth, and the data, as you can see, absolutely agrees with the globe Earth. And this criticism Dream Caliper has posted here essentially shows that he, or they, I always say he, I'm sorry, they are not particularly knowledgeable of the heliocentric, or as they call it, the heliocentric model. So, yeah, I believe that was a thorough, I don't want to call it dismantling, but it was, of this whole debate. With that, I thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please do consider leaving a like and maybe even consider subscribing. And with that, I will see you in the next one. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.